Welcome to 15 Minutes of Fangs and Folklore with your host, Matthew Miller. We give you pint-sized, bite-sized pieces of supernatural monster lore, exploring their origins, their history, and their meaning to the human condition. Listen on, if you dare. <laughs> Picture this, if you would. It's the Middle Ages. You live in a small village somewhere in Eastern Europe. It's midnight. Fog has set in among the small houses of the tiny farming community. Everyone there is already superstitious, so when a knock comes on your door in the dark of the night, you freeze in fear. What to do? You decide to cautiously open the door, and you scream when you see your deceased friend standing there. He beckons you to him, but you are much too terrified, so you shut the door. You can't sleep the rest of the night. The next day, you find out that you are not the only one the revenant visited. After several nights of this, a sickness spreads throughout the village. You and the others become angry, blaming the disease on the undead man and his nightly visits. Torches blazing, you lead a party to his grave. Dig him up and notice that his corpse looks as fresh and healthy as the day you buried him. You drive a stake through his chest. He screams, and fresh blood flows from the wound. To be certain, you cut his head off and bury him with a cross on his chest. The village sickness goes away, and he never bothers anyone again. I'm your host, Matthew Miller, expert on all things monstrous and paranormal. I'm a horror writer from the dark and haunted swamps of Louisiana. It's my pleasure to welcome you into my terrifying world here on my podcast, 15 Minutes of Fangs and Folklore. Please check out my books on Amazon, beginning with the one entitled Blood Feud, A Punk Rock Vampire Story. That's Blood Feud, A Punk Rock Vampire Story by Matthew Miller. That's volume one of my Gravedigger series. The Gravediggers are a punk rock band who keep crossing paths with all sorts of dark, evil, nasty creatures. It's horror, and it's comedy, and it's super entertaining, so get your copy. Of all the supernatural monsters and creatures in folklore, maybe the vampire has the most allure. The English word vampire comes from actually a group of old uh, Eastern European language words that refer to witches or to the undead coming back to life. We call that revenance. Revenant from the French, coming back. <clears throat> the modern vampire is usually portrayed as handsome and charming, right? Count Dracula, or a prince. That's a relatively new invention, really created by an author called John William Polidori in his 1819 novel, The Vampire, spelled with a Y. He's the one who's credited as changing the vampire into a handsome and suave gentleman. But that's so different from the original concept of the vampire, we'll see. Of course, Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula, is without a doubt the most famous novel about a suave and alluring vampire, right? He, he, uh, he uh, seduces the young girls in the novel. We have the first important literary female vampire, and she was a lesbian. Her name was Carmilla, and shared in Le Fanu's 1872 novel of the same name, Carmilla. What is a vampire, though? What is a vampire? General definition is that a vampire is a revenant, a person who died and came back, who subsists on blood. Keep in mind, for now, that the oldest concepts of vampires were not these charming, beautiful, suave ladies and gentlemen who happened to drink blood. But no, they were risen corpses, with all of the disgust that comes with that idea. Rotting, lumbering, very similar to our modern concept of a zombie, but blood drinking and more self-aware and sentient. Keep in mind also that vampiric creatures appear in lore from around the world, not just in Europe. And we'll explore a variety of vampires in uh, this segment of the podcast, Fangs and Folklore, 
uh, the vampire segment. So get your garlic ready, let's dive right in to the grave. We'll start in Europe because that's certainly the, the concept of the vampire that most of the listeners here are used to. The earliest recorded reference to a vampiric creature is debatable, the earliest one in the world, but probably comes from the writings of the Persians around 2000 BC. Some potsherds depict some sort of creature drinking people's blood, and so it counts as a vampire. But let's take a look first at European history, like I said. After all, the vast majority of modern vampire literature and film and art is based on the European concept of the vampire. <clears throat> Usually the way it's told, a Wallachian prince and warlord named Vlad Tepis, nicknamed Vlad the Impaler, lived in medieval Transylvania, Romania. This was true. He's a real historical character. And he had a reputation of great cruelty toward his enemies. He was a successful warrior, and he would impale the bodies of his enemies on tall spikes as a warning and, of course, as a psychological deterrent. I don't know about you, but it would certainly deter me. And the story goes that Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula, got the idea from the historical account of old Vlad, and the legend took off from there. Well, that story is actually not true. Vlad Tepes was not the first uh, archetypal vampire. Let's go a little deeper. Vlad Tepes was a real historical character, yes. He impaled his enemies, and uh, he had a reputation even for drinking blood, though you never know how much you know, legend, in fact, uh, mix in that particular uh, uh, lore. Uh, just as an aside, he was considered a folk hero by the local peasants, and still is to some degree, if you go to the area of Transylvania, Romania, uh, some, you know, a lot of people still consider him kind of a historical folk uh, hero. But Bram Stoker did not get his idea of Dracula from Vlad Tepes. He got it rather from old Irish folk tales. He was Irish. Those, of course, may have previously come from Eastern Europe, but Stoker learned about vampire lore directly from his fellow Irishmen. And in fact, European vampire lore seems to stem from the Middle Ages and from Eastern Europe first, from actual eyewitness accounts and stories of revenants. So when we talk about the vampire, we're not just talking about you know, total fantasy. Um, not saying they're real, or are they? We don't, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But what I'm saying is there are cases of vampirism that have been well documented throughout the Chronicles of the Middle Ages, uh, especially Eastern Europe. So let's take a look at some of these stories. Uh, the earliest references to vampire-like creatures in Europe occur in Walter Mapp's 12th century work, uh, the Latin title De Nugis Curialium, which means the, uh, the baubles of the court, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the toys of the court, something like that the distractions of the court. In 12th century, that means in the 1100s, that's fairly early, right? Um, Walter Mapp was an Irish clerk. He lived and worked in England. And one of his stories involves a man named Edric Wilde, or Wilda, depending on what language, uh, stage of language would have been spoken at that point. So, pardon me, I had to take a sip there of my hot blood, uh, uh, my hot tea. <clears throat> one night, uh, so this Eric, Edric, rather, is at a local pub. He spots a group of women. They seem supernaturally young and beautiful. There's something about them. They glow. They, the way they move, the way they hold themselves, it's bizarre. But he's smitten immediately. For some unknown reason, he's reminded of warnings from his youth about creatures who bathe in blood to preserve their youth. For some reason, he has reason to suspect these women of that. And so, Believing that they could be monsters, he still enters the room. He has sex with the most beautiful woman, in his opinion. Later, he marries her, has sons with her, okay? Uh, one day, she was late for an uh, appointment to meet the king, and Edric became angry with her. He accused her of ignoring her wifely duties to spend too much time with her sisters, and so she leaves him, but he keeps the sons. And that's it. That's the story. It's vague. Uh, it does, though, show you that, at least in the 12th century, there is a belief in creatures who use blood to maintain eternal youth. That's the high Middle Ages, right? So that's pretty old. The fact that Walter Mapp, the, the writer, and Edric Wilde knew of these legends, it implies that the lore existed from an earlier period. We don't know how much earlier. Then there's William of Newburgh, who was an English chronicler. He wrote uh, about the same time as Walter Mapp. And his great work, Historia Rerum Ag Anglicorum, which means a history of the matters of the English, uh, records several accounts of vampire-like activity. So there's one story in Buckinghamshire, 
A dead man returns several nights in a row to sexually harass his widow. When she tells this to her family members, uh, the deceased husband starts to show up and harass them and her neighbors every night and only at night. The solution was a priest. He wrote out an absolution of the dead man's sins, placed it on uh, the corpse itself. You know, they, they dug him up. After that, it rested in peace. No more problems. <laughs> uh, another story uh, um, who is uh, not recounted by William of Newburgh also in Buckinghamshire, it involves a dead clergyman, it doesn't say whether he's a priest or a monk, but probably a monk, who rose from the grave, haunted his former abbey, and harassed a woman in the local village, presumably sexually harassed her. So another monk sat vigil over uh, the revenant's grave one night. The body rose, he attacked it with an axe, and the body returned to the grave. The next day, his mo uh, that monk and his fellow monks dug up the body, found it bleeding and wounded from the axe, so they burned it, and it never rose again. Well, what can we make of these very early stories? These are the earliest ones. <clears throat> Ignoring for the moment the question of whether they're just legends or actual accounts, can we truly call these revenants vampires? After all, none of them really are reported as drinking blood, right? The closest thing is those sisters bathing in blood. And drinking blood is certainly a key trait of vampires. Were they just zombies? Well... Even without the blood drinking, these stories do have other aspects of vampirism. There's the rising from the dead, rising from the grave. Notice they're active only at night. They sleep during the day, return to the grave during the day to rest. They're not killed with normal weapons like an axe. They're destroyed through church actions, you know, through holy actions or uh, through burning. So personally, I would include these revenants as vampires, maybe not as developed uh, an idea of vampire as we have today, but still in that vein. So, uh, next we have another vampire case, Jure Grando Alilovic. So this is in 1656 common era, in modern day Croatia, in the district of Istria. So his name is Jure Grando Alilovic. I don't speak uh, Croatian, so I may be mispronouncing that. He was a simple farmer in the village of Kringa. Now this account was written by the scientist Johann Weikart von Valvasor of the Holy Roman Empire, who was actually a big deal. He was one of the uh, uh, royal or a papal, maybe you'd say, uh, chroniclers. And he visited Kringa and heard the story there. The alleged vampire, uh, our friend Jure, he died of sickness in 1656. So that's a little after the late Middle Ages. I'd consider that the early modern period. And according to the villagers, for 16 years after his death, Jure would come out of his grave at night, 16 years. It's not clear whether this meant every night, but when he did rise, he would knock on the doors of various villagers, and the people in the house uh, uh, you know, that he knocked on the doors of would soon die. Uh, one night, he entered his window, uh, widow's bedroom. He was smiling. He looked like a corpse that was smiling, wheezing for breath. He sexually assaulted her. How horrible that must have been. <clears throat> and then a local priest, Father Giorgio, found the vampire one night, he ran across him, and he held up a cross and shouted, this is translated into English, Behold Jesus Christ, you vampire! Stop tormenting us! A village leader named Mio Radici, uh, sorry, Radetic <laughs> led a group of villagers in chase after the vampire Jure. They tried to stake him with a hawthorn stake, but the stake wouldn't penetrate the chest. It just kind of bounced off of it. Another night, uh, nine villagers decided to dig up Jure, and so they opened his grave, noticed that his corpse looked healthy and was smiling. Now keep in mind, this would have been 16 years after his death, in a time and place where mummification and even embalming were not practiced. So, uh, you know, corpses are just put in the grave. So Jure should have been just bones, right? Uh, but he wasn't. He was plump and smiling. And Father Giorgio said, Look, vampire, there is Jesus Christ who saved us from hell and died for us. And you, vampire, you cannot have peace. They tried to stake him again. The stake, once again, wouldn't penetrate his chest. So the priest, Father Giorgio, prays from the Catholic rite of exorcism. Then a villager named Stepan Mila, Milashit <laughs> used a saw to decapitate Jure. As he started sawing away at his neck, Jure screamed in pain. Fresh blood poured from the wound. Uh, Milashit managed to finish removing his head. He took the head completely off, in fact. And Jure never bothered anyone again. He remained in his grave. Very well documented. Again, though, there's no mention of Jure drinking blood. 
Instead, he's just kind of like an undead pervert, right? And a harbinger of death. He knocks on a door, people in the house die soon thereafter. And indeed, part of them, uh, the vampire lore, is this creature as a carrier of disease. One of the proposed etymologies of the word Nosferatu, in fact, is a carrier of night or carrier of disease. It's maybe related, uh, related to the Latin nocain, so nocus, meaning noxious or harmful, the nos part. And then fere, to carry, feratu, carrier. But no one really knows the certain etymology. But what we do see is the consi uh, consistent theme of a corpse it rises from the dead, only active at night, it harasses people. And then one last thought is that we don't see Jure there described as drinking blood, but when they did cut his neck, fresh blood flowed from the wound, so that presumably came from somewhere. Of note is that Father Giorgio, in the original Venetian language, which they spoke at the time, uh, uh, um, Serbia being a uh, territory of Austria at that time, he called Jure a strigon, that's the word, strigon. And this word uh, can mean vampire, certainly, in the language, but it can also refer to a wizard or a warlock, as well as a creature who generally just rises from the grave, and even to creatures who can shapeshift. So there is some ambiguity there um, about what this Stirigon really meant. All right, it's been 15 minutes already of fangs and folklore. Next episode, we're going to look at the amazing case of Petar Blagodjevic, this is an extremely well-documented case of vampirism. So for now, I'd like to thank you for tuning in to the very first episode of Fangs and Folklore. And I hope your interest is aroused enough, resurrected, risen up enough to listen next time. Thank you for listening, and good night. Good night.